The most exciting and challenging part of your pilot training is learning the maneuvers you will demonstrate for the examiner during your practical test. This program is designed to help you develop the necessary skills to accurately and safely maneuver your airplane. When you begin flight training, your instructor will demonstrate each maneuver for you. Then you will practice the maneuver. To ensure that you have control of the airplane and ensure there is no confusion, you and your instructor should exercise positive exchange of flight controls. The FAA suggests this simple verbal exercise to ensure the flying pilot knows the non-flying pilot has accepted control and is flying the aircraft. Do you have any questions about this one? Nope, I don't think so. You want to give it a try? Sure. You have the flight controls. I have the flight controls. You have the flight controls. Another safety consideration while maneuvering your airplane in the practice area is collision avoidance. In the practice environment, you can be easily distracted, so you should make a special effort to maintain your visual scan while maneuvering. On the other hand, before you begin a maneuver, you should make clearing turns, which usually consist of at least a 180 degree change in direction, such as two 90 degree turns. Clearing turns provide you with a view of the area around your flight path and make it easier to maintain visual contact with other aircraft in the practice area. Your instructor will show you how to clear the area prior to maneuvering. Since most of the maneuvers you are going to learn during your flight training are practiced at relatively low altitude, you should always be vigilant for appropriate emergency landing sites. Good choices for emergency landing sites might be open pastures, turf farms, and hard-packed dirt fields. A road is not always a good option because some may have power lines, trees, or a lot of traffic. It is important to remember that some maneuvers, when not properly executed, may place unusually high load factors on your aircraft. To avoid this, you should be aware of your airplane's operating and airspeed limitations and listen carefully to your instructor so you do not overstress the aircraft. For specific information, refer to your pilot's operating handbook. No matter what type of aircraft you are flying, you need to make sure it is airworthy and safe to fly before you leave the ground. An organized procedure helps you check the systems and equipment in the airplane. This procedure is called the pre-flight inspection. Regardless of how many times you perform the pre-flight, always use the written checklist provided for the airplane you're flying. This step-by-step -step procedure ensures that you examine every item and the airplane is ready to fly. This program is designed to give general guidelines to follow during the pre-flight and engine start. Keep in mind that pre-flight procedures can vary among aircraft of the same make and model and obviously between manufacturers. Start your inspection in the cabin by checking to see all required paperwork is in order, including the airworthiness certificate. Registration. FCC radio station license, the pilot's operating handbook or the approved flight manual, and weight and balance information. Set the parking brake to ensure that the airplane will not move once the wheel chocks and wing tie downs are removed. Next, remove the control wheel lock to free the control surfaces for the walk around inspection. This will also expose the ignition magneto switch and avionics power switch so that you can check to ensure both are in the off position. It is important to note that the engine could fire if the ignition magneto switch is in the on position and someone moves the propeller. Turn the master switch to on. If a split rocker switch is installed, turn the battery side on to use the power to check the fuel quantity indicators and to listen for the sound of the avionics cooling fan. The indications of the fuel gauges should correspond to the actual fuel level you will check later. Once you have noted the fuel levels and verified the operation of the fan, lower the flaps and turn the master switch off. The fuel selector valve should be in the both position. By moving the selector slightly to the left and right, you should feel a detent position, which indicates the valve is in the proper position for flight. 
Check the baggage door to confirm that it's locked. As you move toward the tail section, inspect the general condition of the fuselage, looking for abnormalities in the skin, such as wrinkles or loose rivets. Also make sure all antennas and access panels are secure. Inspect the stabilizer surfaces for general condition, looking for dents, wrinkles, and loose rivets. Examine the control surfaces on the tail, checking for freedom of movement and security. Then, check the control cables for excess play and loose or missing safety wires. Check both sides of the control surface attachment points for loose bolts and apparent damage, and remove the tail tie-down. Continue your walk around as you inspect the remainder of the tail section. Check the right side of the fuselage for imperfections and damage. This also provides an excellent opportunity for you to visually inspect the top surface of the wing. Next, inspect the right wing flap tracks for security and wear. Moving outboard to the wing tip, inspect the aileron hinges for security, wear, and freedom of movement. In addition, check the aileron pushrod for damage and security. Check the wing tip for possible damage and security. Then, inspect the right navigation light. Check the leading edge of the wing for dents and other damage. Inspect the attachment points of the main landing gear for dents or wrinkles. Visually check the tire for wear, cuts, abrasions, and proper inflation. Examine the hydraulic brakes and brake lines for security and leaks. With a fuel strainer, drain a few ounces of fuel from the quick drain to check for sediment, water, and any contaminants. Also, note the color of the fuel to confirm it is the proper grade for the airplane. This check should be accomplished before the first flight each day and after refueling. Some airplanes have a fuel selector quick drain and an additional fuel line quick drain located on the bottom of the fuselage. Both should be sampled and checked for sediment, contamination, water, and proper fuel grade. Remove the fuel cap and make sure the level in the tank corresponds to that indicated on the fuel gauge. The fuel cap on the right wing is vented, so visually inspect it for damage and obstructions. Then carefully check the general condition of the wing surface. During winter months and in cold climates, make sure the surface is free of frost and snow accumulation. As you move to the nose section, ensure the windshield is clean and check the general condition of the cowling. Look under the nose section for fuel or oil leaks. Check the oil level to ensure the quantity is sufficient for the flight. Keep in mind, the pilot operating handbook specifies a higher minimum amount of oil for extended flights than it does for short or local flights. Pull the fuel strainer knob for several seconds to clear the strainer of any possible water and sediment. Ensure the knob is full in and closed. With the cowling secured, continue to the propeller and spinner. Carefully inspect the propeller for defects, such as nicks and cracks. Look into the inlets to make sure they are clear of obstructions. Check the alternator belt through the air inlet. Visually check the condition and ensure that it has the proper tension. Verify the landing light is intact and clean. Then examine the air filter to make sure it's clean, secured, and not damaged. Check the nose wheel tire for wear, damage, and proper inflation. Also, inspect the condition of the gear strut. Make sure the static port located on the fuselage is clean and unobstructed. Check the left main landing gear and drain a few ounces of fuel from the quick drain to check for sediment, water, and any contaminants. Then inspect the fuel quantity and the left wing in the same way as the right. An additional item to check on this wing is the pitot tube. Make sure the opening in the front of the pitot tube is clean and free of obstructions. An important part of the fuel system check is to make sure the fuel tank vent is open. This vent 
relieves pressure, and allows fuel to escape from the tank during hot conditions. It also prevents a partial vacuum from forming as fuel is being used. Another important item to check is the stall warning detector on the leading edge of the wing. It should move freely and be unobstructed. You can test the warning horn by turning the master switch on, lifting the detector, and listening for the horn. Examine the left aileron and the flap for damage, wear, and freedom of movement. If you find a problem during the pre-flight, have it checked by a certified maintenance technician before you fly the airplane. Each airplane has its own unique starting procedure. The procedure itself can vary depending on whether the engine is cold, hot, or flooded, or whether external power is used. It's extremely important to use the checklist for your airplane as well as the one for the appropriate conditions. Before you start the engine, adjust your seat for comfort and visibility. Make sure the seat is locked into position and will not slip. Then, fasten your seatbelt and shoulder harness. If you're carrying passengers, be sure to brief them on how to fasten their seatbelts and shoulder harnesses and how to latch and unlatch the cabin doors. For safety, test the brakes by pressing on the top of the rudder pedals with your toes, then reset the parking brake. To avoid possible damage to the avionics, make sure the avionics power switch is turned off. Then visually check and slide your fingers across the circuit breakers to make sure they are in and set. As an added precaution, Verify that all electrical equipment, including the autopilot, is turned off. You should now check the fuel selector, ensuring it is in the both position. In warm temperatures, one or two strokes of the primer should be sufficient. In cold weather, up to six strokes of the primer may be necessary. Moving back to the throttle quadrant, place the carburetor heat lever to the cold position and open the throttle one-eighth of an inch. Now, set the mixture control to rich. Visually clear the area in the vicinity of the airplane. Make sure you look behind the airplane to ensure that debris from the prop wash will not endanger people or vehicles on the ramp. Then, open the window and call out, clear, Where? and look and listen for a response. Turn on the master switch. Then, engage the starter by turning the ignition magneto switch to the start position. When the engine fires, release the starter switch and advance the throttle to the appropriate setting. Check the oil pressure gauge to assure that it registers adequately. If the pressure does not register within 30 seconds to a minute, shut down the engine and determine the cause. During your training, you will learn the importance of the pre-flight inspection and how it enhances flying safety. As you get ready to taxi for takeoff, you'll know that the extra time you spent covering all of the items on the checklist will help you to make sure your airplane is ready to fly. Like every other aspect of flying, you must employ special techniques when you operate on the ground to ensure you maintain control of your airplane. Let's take a look at those procedures. When you're ready to taxi, advance the throttle just enough to start the airplane rolling forward. Apply the brakes as soon as you start forward to make sure they're working properly. You'll find that more power is needed to start the airplane rolling than is needed to keep it moving. Your speed should be kept slow, especially in congested areas on the ramp. Control your taxi speed primarily with the throttle. Although applying the brakes will help you slow down, they should be used only when a throttle reduction is insufficient. This prevents excessive wear and overheating of the brakes. Steering is quite simple on most tricycle gear airplanes. Since the nose wheel is linked to the rudder pedals, Applying pressure to them causes the nose wheel and rudder to deflect and turns the airplane. Because the engine is cooled by airflow, a prolonged taxi can cause it to overheat. 
monitor the engine gauges closely and follow the manufacturer's recommended procedures to improve cooling. Wind blowing over the airplane and its control surfaces is another consideration when taxiing. Let's take a look at several situations and see how the flight controls are used to overcome the adverse effects of wind. There are two general guidelines you should follow. If the wind is blowing toward the front of the airplane, turn the control wheel toward the wind and apply neutral or slight forward pressure. If the wind is from behind the airplane, turn the control wheel away from the wind and push it full forward. Let's take a look at why these general guidelines are true. When you taxi into a direct headwind, the air moves equally above and below the wings. With the control wheel in the neutral position, the airplane exhibits the same stable handling characteristics as it does in flight. In a direct tailwind, moving the control wheel full forward places the elevator in the down position. In this situation, the wind strikes the upper surface and exerts pressure on the top of the elevator. This prevents the tail from being lifted and the airplane from nosing over. A wind from the side, such as this quartering headwind, tends to lift the upwind wing and roll the airplane. When you turn the control wheel into the wind, the upwind aileron moves up and the downwind aileron moves down. The wind flowing over the control surfaces tends to push the left wing down, the right wing up, and counteracts the tipping tendency. If the wind is behind the airplane, as with this left quartering tailwind, you'll need to position the controls differently. Again, the wind tends to lift the upwind wing. It also tends to lift the tail. In this situation, move the control wheel opposite the wind direction and apply forward pressure. This raises the right aileron lowers the left aileron and places the elevator in the down position. As the wind blows across the airplane, the aerodynamic forces created by the displaced ailerons and elevator will counteract the rolling and tipping tendencies. The wind flowing over the airplane changes as you turn and you'll need to reposition the control surfaces. Always be aware of the wind direction. Even in very light winds, position the controls appropriately. After taxiing to the run-up area, align the nose of your aircraft into the wind. Try to keep the propeller blast away from the other aircraft. Using a printed checklist from the aircraft manufacturer, make sure every item is checked and nothing is omitted. Whether you set the parking brake or hold the brakes with your feet, you should divide your attention between cockpit duties and outside the aircraft to make sure it doesn't start moving forward during the run-up. Make sure the cabin doors are closed and locked. Also, close and lock both windows. When you turn the control wheel to the right, the right aileron will move up and the left aileron will move down. Conversely, turning the controls to the left will move the left aileron up and the right aileron down. To help you remember which aileron is up, place both hands on the control wheel and move it to the right. If you extend your thumbs, they will point to the aileron in the up position. Pulling back on the control wheel will cause the elevator to move up and pushing forward on the control wheel will move the elevator down. To check the rudder for proper operation, depress the right rudder pedal and it will move the rudder to the right. Left rudder pedal pressure will cause the rudder to move to the left. Next, check and set your flight instruments. Set the altimeter to the current altimeter setting or if the current setting is not available, adjust it to the field elevation. Check and adjust your attitude indicator to ensure the miniature aircraft is in a wings level position on the horizon bar. Set the heading indicator to the magnetic compass indication. Place the fuel selector valve to the fullest tank or to the both position as recommended in the pilot's operating handbook. Now set the elevator trim to the takeoff position. 
smoothly advance the throttle to the appropriate RPM and adjust the mixture control as required for the field elevation or as recommended in the pilot's operating handbook. If your pilot's operating handbook has an amplified procedure section, refer to the section on leaning the mixture for high altitude operation and high field elevations. To check the magnetos, move the ignition switch first to the right position and note the RPM drop. Move the switch back to the both position and then move the ignition switch to the left position and note the RPM drop. Return the switch to the both position. Switching from both magnetos to the left or right magneto individually should cause the engine RPM to drop. In most cases, a drop of around 125 RPM is acceptable for individual magneto operation. However, the difference between the left and right magneto drop should not exceed 25 to 50 RPM, depending on manufacturer's recommendations. If you don't get a drop in RPM, it may be the result of a faulty magneto ground wire, and the aircraft should not be flown. Apply carburetor heat and check for a drop in RPM. Then return the carburetor heat control to the off position. In some geographical areas with high humidity or visible moisture, you can experience carburetor ice while taxiing. This may be noted by a larger initial drop in RPM followed by a slight increase in RPM. The initial drop may be accompanied by engine roughness, which should subside with the RPM increase. Check the suction gauge. It should be indicating between 4.5 and 5.4 inches of mercury. Now, check the ammeter. The ammeter shows the charging rate applied to the battery. If the alternator is not working or the electrical load exceeds the output of the alternator, the ammeter indicates the battery discharge rate. Reduce the power back to idle RPM and begin an avionics check. Check the transponder. For a VFR flight, you should use the code number of 1200 in your transponder. However, some tower controlled airports have special local procedures and may assign a discrete code. Once you have confirmed the transponder code, check the communication and nav aid frequencies. Quickly review the performance airspeeds and departure procedures and finish the checklist items. Of course, airspeeds and procedures will vary with aircraft. Correct procedures are those recommended in the pilot's operating handbook for your aircraft. Release the parking brake. Always check for other traffic before you leave the run-up area, including the final approach path, taxiways you may cross to get to the runway, and the runway itself. Remember, opposite direction traffic may be in effect. You should also check for traffic when departing a tower-controlled field. Proper engine shutdown requires that you use the appropriate checklist, just as you did for the engine start. Make sure the radios, electrical equipment, and avionics power switches are turned off. Then place the mixture control in idle cutoff. When the engine has stopped, turn the ignition magneto and master switches off. Next, Install the control lock to prevent wind gusts from damaging the flight controls. Then, be sure to place the fuel selector valve in the left or right position to prevent cross-feeding. It's important to remember that your flight is not complete until the airplane is secure. In some cases, you may have to move the airplane into the tie-down space by using its tow bar. As you steer the airplane, Remember that it is sometimes difficult to judge how close the wingtips and tail are to other aircraft or obstacles. You may want to have someone at the wingtips to help guide the airplane. Once you're in position, place wheel chocks in front and behind the main wheels to prevent the airplane from moving. You should also make certain that the wing and tail tie downs are properly secured. A key element to a safe, successful flight 
is maintaining positive control of your airplane. This is just as important on the ground as it is in the air. By taking the time to learn proper ground operations, you will be adding to your skills as a competent pilot.